And now, it's time for Southern California's Sports Fishing Voice. Let's talk hook up. For the next two hours, join Pete Gray, rock cod Rick Maxa, and this week's special expert guest for fishing information, new techniques to catch more fish, and the most current scoop on what's happening in the water. Let's Talk Hook Up is sponsored in part by Yamaha Outboards. Reliability starts here. By Ford, the official truck of Let's Talk Hook Up. And Shimano Rods and Reels. Fish with the best. Shimano. Get ready for the fastest two hours on radio with the hosts of Let's Talk Hook Up, Pete Gray and Rock Cod Rick Maxa. Good morning, anglers, and welcome to Let's Talk Hook Up. I'm Pete Gray with Rock Cod Rick Maxa. We're in the mighty 1090 studios with Mike Shane from Hub Sea World Research Institute. We have a lot to learn this morning from this amazing man here and this incredible organization. You stay tuned. It's going to be a good one. Let's Talk Hook Up, Southern California sport fishing voice on the mighty 1090. When bad weather and rough seas send other boats back to the dock, SeaKeeper allows you to fish longer and fish harder, even in the roughest conditions. Don't believe it? Just ask those that have put them on their boat, like Captain Pete Grosbeck and other professionals. Fishing in the trough with SeaKeeper basically eliminates the trough. SeaKeeper's newest offering, the SeaKeeper 3, is optimized to eliminate up to 95% of boat roll on boats between 30 and 39 feet. Even better, this gyro is so small it can fit inside a customized leaning post and operate on your current battery system, making installation fast and easy. Watch for new product coming soon. The SeaKeeper for boats. Think about it. Eliminate up to 95% of boat roll on your boat. That is amazing. Amazing! To learn more about how Seakeeper can change your life on the water and to schedule your free demo, go to Seakeeper.com. Take a ride, be amazed. Seakeeper. It's long range time at the Ridge and Lower Banks. Time to get your gear. Hi, this is Doug Kern from Fisherman's Landing Tackle, the saltwater tackle professionals. Big fish need big tackle, and that's why we recommend the Shimano Talica for tuna, Trinidad for Wahoo, matched with a Therese rod. Choosing the right size Talica, Trinidad, and Therese is the trick, and that's where we come in, with more experience and expertise on long range fishing than anyone. Fisherman's Landing Tackle has the Shimano gear for your long range trip. Fisherman's Landing tackle at Fisherman's Landing in San Diego or on the web at saltwatertackle.com. There are plenty of boat slips and marinas in San Diego, but there is only one Kona Kai. It's not just a place to park your boat. It's a way of life here in America's finest city. Come check out what's new at the Kona Kai. 170 luxury guest rooms, including 41 brand new suites featuring contemporary island-inspired decor, deep soaking tubs, and oversized balconies. The Kona Kai Resort Spa and Marina has multiple swimming pools and a private beach, waterfront restaurants, and an award-winning spa, most of which is included for marina tenants. Add the Kona Kai Club to your membership and you have access to the new Paloma Pool Bar, a new and exclusive pool area for adults only, which allows guests to enjoy poolside craft cocktails and California coastal cuisine while overlooking your boat. In addition to all this, Kona Kai is the closest marina to the open ocean. Check resortkonakai.com on the web for more information to reserve a slip or inquire about joining the club, the Kona Kai Resort, much more than just a place to park your boat. We all need to get around, but we all need something different from our vehicles. Your San Diego County Ford dealers have you covered if you're looking for a new truck this month. Plus, it's SUV season, so they have great deals for everyone. Whether it's a new Echo Sport that is nimble and fun around town, or the Ford Explorer that is capable of putting a boat in the water and has seating for seven, Ford has you covered. Ford trucks and SUVs aren't just powerful and legendary. They have the latest technology that helps you seamlessly connect your smartphone and ensure you're safe on the road. Features like Pro Trailer Backup Assist on trucks are truly a game changer at the ramp, helping you back up a trailer by simply turning a knob on the dash and doing the hard work for you. So check out all the great deals during SUV season and save some money on the right gear for you. Learn more at buyfordnow.com or visit your San Diego County Ford dealers today, they'll be glad to hook you up. Hook up! Welcome back to Let's Talk Hook Up on the Mighty 1090. Been so looking forward to having this guy in the studio this morning. So much good information to come Indeed. today. Yeah, Mike Shane, good morning. Hi, good, Mike. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Thank you for having me and giving me this opportunity to uh, 
coming to the show today. Of course. You guys do such great work at Hub Sea World Research and your, your entire team, uh, Don Kent, uh, Mark Drawbridge, and the team there. You, I, I guess we're, I don't know, showing our age. You've been there 30 years, Mike? Yes, 30 years. Yeah, <laughs> and, and Don and Mark. Don, Don. Mark's about the same time. Don's, uh, he's been there a little longer. I'm not sure exactly. He's probably closer to 40 years. Wow. So, uh, yeah. What incredible dedication. Yeah, no kidding. And, for those of our listeners that may not be familiar with what you do at Hub Sea World Research Institute, what, what's the yeah. program? So our organization, Hub Sea World Research Institute, is a nonprofit 5013C that was founded uh, by the, uh, the fathers who were the organiz- people that were building Sea World at the time in the early 60s, and they founded our organization, this nonprofit, a year before they opened uh, Sea World Park. Um, with the mission to return to the sea some measure of the benefits derived from it. And so we support that mission uh, through five kind of key program areas that our organization does. Uh, One of them is wildlife populations. Uh, So we try to understand the relationships between the marine animals and their environment in order to, you know, address the threats to ecosystem health. Uh, Ocean health, that's our second program area. So that program looks at how marine life in the oceans are affected by the natural and human-induced changes, such as, you know, climate change and that sort of stuff. Uh, animal behavior, so that's our, our third key area that focuses on sound uh, in the environment. So how are marine animals, how do they produce the sound, and how are they affected by natural and human-made sounds? And then uh, a fourth program area is our sustainable seafood. That's what I'll talk about more today, a program that I've been involved with. But that, you know, we're currently working to replenish wild stocks of depleted species like the white sea bass, most of your listeners are familiar with, and also demonstrating sustainable aquaculture to supplement, you know, sources of seafood and fish for our, uh, our country here. And then the fifth core area um, is, is, is huge. It's, it's basically we're committed. It's uh, education and outreach. Mm-hmm. So we're committed to inspiring the next generation of ocean scientists and uh, by advancing their appreciation, the public's appreciation for scientific inquiry. So these are going to be, you know, our next. That's our, great. Next, yeah, that's yeah awesome. that, that the people that are going to take over your job when you retire, right? Someday, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, let's talk for a minute. You mentioned uh, one very important thing, and that is aquaculture. I know Hub Sea World Research Institute has been working quite diligently on aquaculture. And kind of an example, I guess, correct me if I'm wrong, of aquaculture would be those bluefin tuna pens at the Coronado Islands. Is that considered aquaculture? That's considered, um, what do I want to say, uh, Ocean ranching. Or farm ocean ranching. ranching. Yeah. It's not so, aquaculture. Yes, yeah. So we, it's a sort of a, a more advanced in the sense of they're not growing, the, they're not starting with, with eggs and larvae. They're actually going out and harvesting or catching small small fish and then bringing them back to these pens to sort of grow them up and, and fatten them. So, kind of like a feedlot. Yeah, yeah. 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 Like so, so yeah. So, there, but there are some other aquaculture systems going on down in, in Mexico, similar to what we're with the work that we're doing as well. Too. But actual yeah. aquaculture yeah. differs in that you are actually growing them from the start, right? Right, right. Start. growing them. Yeah, yeah. Right. So whether it's fish, whether it's mussels, um, you know, the same thing with with with, you know, with mussels. You've got to get seed, so you've got to you know you, you put strings and lines on the water to allow these organisms to attach to and. So you can do it that way. The same thing with algae. I mean, you've got algae in, in almost in tanks where you're getting them to sort of reproduce so you can get the seed to grow the algae up. And so aquaculture is just not about fish. It's about, you know, invertebrates and, and algae as well, too. I see. Okay. So uh, I know there's some uh, some growth aquaculture programs up in Carlsbad right near the hatchery there for oysters and mussels, right? That, exactly. That yes. would be yes. aquaculture, aquaculture there. Yes. So they're doing yeah. that. They're actually... Again, growing mussels uh, and, and the other bivalves there. Yeah, a little at, at easier facility. than fish, though. Yes. Yeah. I think so, yes. I mean, there's a lot. Sigh. Yeah. For the for the I guess yeah for the certainly for the the day to day health management. I mean, you, with fish, you have to go out there and, and feed them and take care of them and can't crowd them too much. With with you know mussels, you just kind of let them out there and keep them contained and let them do their own thing. You know, Mother Nature provides the food. For them, as they as their filter feeders taking that food out of the water column. So, so aquaculture, in the sense of of what you guys are doing at the hubs, is what? What do you, what? What's the program? Yeah. So, uh, our biggest program, the one that we've been operating for 30 years, is the stock replenishment for uh, the white sea bass program. So, we have been for over 30 years now the contractors to the Department of Fish and Wildlife to perform 
uh, see if stock replenishment is a, a possible tool for them to use to help manage the fisheries and, and, and return a uh, depleted fishery back to a, a healthier level. So we have a, a purpose-built facility in Carlsbad that uh, we have in captivity there at this facility, uh, five large broodstock, we call broodstock tanks. These are tanks with sea bass, adults, that are 40, 50, 60 pounds swimming around in these tanks. Each tank, our goal is to have 50 fish in each tank. We control the temperature and the daylight in these tanks, and each tank is on a different season. So right now there's a, a tank that's already on summer conditions, and, and even though we're going into the fall, there's a tank with winter conditions. So when as we control that temperature and photo period, and as it gets to be like spring conditions in their tanks, those fish naturally just spawn. Um, hey, it's springtime. It's time yeah, to, time exactly. To go. It's time to go. When it happens when it gets springtime, when you get more daylight, you get the water starts to warm up. And so when these fish feel that change, they naturally, I mean, we don't have to inject hormones. We don't do anything. All we do is feed them, and they just swim around and eat and, and make babies for us. So what a lifestyle. That's you know, so pretty cool. incredible. Yeah. Cool thing, so, man. This is yeah, awesome. When they spawn, the eggs are, are what we call pelagic. They float out of the tank. We collect them up, measure the volume of eggs. And, and what's amazing is we know and understand that a female, one female, can contribute over about a million and a half eggs. Per, one? Yeah, one female for a spawn event. So if we measure uh, uh, or quantify the volume of eggs in a spawn and we say it's three million eggs, we know that two females can contributed to that, to that spawn. And, and that sets up... Uh, if we're going to make that a production run, how many fish that we can release. We have a genetics management plan that, again, trying to manage this fishery and manage uh, the program as part of our aquaculture work. You know, we, we know we can release a certain amount of fish from those you know, females so we don't create a, any, any problems or a change. And so we then set those eggs up. Uh, they're, you know, spend the, they move through different uh, systems in the facility. So the first 21 days are in a certain tank there and, getting certain types of food, and then they, from there they move to another system with larger, a little bit larger tanks, and the food diets change, and eventually we try to get them onto pellets, which are, can be fine like crumbs, you know, and as they get larger at that point, once they're onto that artificial diets or, or food, the food just, pellets just get larger, and from there they move to a bigger system because every, the work that we do at the hatchery, the systems are what we call in aquaculture closed, or pretty much closed, or recirculating aquaculture systems. So, 90 plus percent of the water is recirculating through there. So you've got all these fish swimming around, peeing and pooping in their water. How do you keep that clean and healthy for them? So we've got special biological filters that take care of that and remove the harmful and toxic uh, ammonia and nitrite from the water wow. um, to keep these fish healthy. And as they move through the systems, then uh, right around 90 days in age, we put a tag in the heads of each of these fish. And then from there, they're uh, delivered to various volunteer-based grow-out sites that are coordinated and operated by the CCA, that's the Coastal Conservation Association. So they, they're helping with this program in, in a huge way. And at, when they get their fish at about three or four inches in size, they then hold them in their grow-out pens, taking care of them for a couple of months, and then release them when they get to be eight to ten inches in size. Wow. And of those million-and-a-half eggs... Uh, that are produced by each female. Yeah. Uh, how ma- have you ever been able to determine how many get to the release point that you? Yeah. Have? So what? Well, that's a good question. We, we can't. Yeah, we can't set up obviously a, a million and a half sure. eggs. That's a lot. And and um, our survival in the hatchery. When you talk about aquaculture, and you basically, so we're taking eggs. We take a certain volume of those eggs. So for example, you have one female. We know our goal. From that one female that spawn, we can release up to fifteen thousand fish out there according to our genetics management wow. plan. So. You know, we'll set up obviously more than than 15,000 eggs. You know, we set up about probably twice or, tr- or triple that amount. But and we have seen actually with our culture work. So from egg to about 50 day, our six our our survival rate has been you know as high as 50 percent. That, wow. And that's tremendous and in, adding, in the hatchery. Yeah, yeah the last bit. couple of years has been 40 to 50 percent. We've had some great success at the hatchery, overcoming some hurdles, just learning. I mean, we've been yes, we've been doing this for 30 years, but. I can't hand you a cookbook right now and say, you know, go grow sea bass. I mean, <laughs> yeah. you can, but there's always, you know, learning and things that are happening and, and go on. So, you know, seeing that 30 to 40 percent in the wild, I mean, look at, a, a, you know, again, these females putting out a million plus eggs. I mean, in the wild, the survivorship is one, two percent, pretty wow. low. Yeah, yeah. yeah. very so, low. Yeah, that's inter- that's, that's an amazing cool. achievement too, yeah. and that's yeah. something, something that that 
I mean, you guys have learned over 30 years of, of being at this, right? And, yeah. And overcoming many, many, many hurdles. Yes, many, many hurdles. And, you know, it's it's the every day, you know, still, still, and we're still learning. I mean, yeah. look, that's that's part of the excitement of the program. You just, you know, it's not the dull routine of walking in day after day out. You know, there's something's either breaking or you got to fix it or something happens or new technologies come along. And so how can we make things better? How can we improve on, on what we're doing? So the program is in, the enhancement program. How do you feel that you've enhanced the wild population of white sea bass in Southern California? Well, we've 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 had, um, as some of your listeners may know, uh, re- recently actually it was completed early this year an independent review of the program. After 30 years, uh, it's kind of was a little overdue, but we had scientists, experts in their areas of uh, fe- in their fields from around the country came together for about three years, and so experts in uh, health in uh, Pathology and aquaculture, uh, enhancement, uh, uh, genetics, uh, what else? Croker biology. So all these people came together, reviewed everything that we provide, provided to them that we've done in the program for 30 years, uh, including you know building some new models on our success, et cetera. And so the report that came out early this year, there was a series of town hall meetings that people came. The the so this was focused just on the scientist side. So the department, you know, this is all being done for them to help give them guidance to the Department of Fish and Wildlife. This summer, there was a series of town hall meetings that, again, that Sea Grant, the California Sea Grant, who's been organizing these, uh, coordinated. Uh, and at these meetings, this gave an, an opportunity, in addition, for contributions from the, the public side, which wasn't part of the report. So the public got to weigh in and, and give their thoughts and what they felt about the program. And uh, what's happening now was now the department needs to make some decisions, and hopefully, you know, we, they've got some recommendations from this review committee uh, to to and, and input from the public as well as the education uh, students that have been involved indirectly with this program uh, through the Seabass in the Classroom program. So the, the department, you know, will now makes some decisions, and it may take them some some time. Right now, we're continuing to operate the program, you know, as we have been for the last uh, couple of years. We have another couple of years of funding to continue while we kind of figure out how we're going. What I want to say was that, you know, we talked about the success, the, the, the um, uh, models that came out from this program. It showed sort of a range of, of pop scenarios, and, and one of them showed that we've probably had about just or just less than a 1% contribution to the fishery. However, what didn't really come out, and that's what everyone kind of ties into, um, was that that used, you know, a, a subset of the data that we've had. We have shown higher successes, and, and the models show that we can have a success rate of, 40 percent to, to the fishery, yes. So we basically, essentially, what we've done over these 30 years is, is learned. It takes a lot to, to just go out there and do this. And obviously, if we had to redo this again, we'd learn from what we did. But in, in effect, what we've done is created a roadmap for successful aquaculture enhancement, and that's being used, you know, not by us, but you know, others in the world. So we've demonstrated. And it had become a role model for stock replenishment uh, in the United States as well as in other parts of the world. So the, the bottom line is is the success rate is somewhere between one and forty percent of revitalizing the 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 population. Yeah, if you were to try to you know take all the data, I mean the forty percent is to show what we what we can can do. I mean, again, we still have right. to work on more. Of that, but yes, we, we can have that. Uh, and part of the problem is is people not turning in heads. They're catching white sea bass. You don't. At this point, you don't really know. It's hard to find out how much the effect is, so that's why the variance is so high, right? Well, and who's to say that, you know, this this tagged sea bass spawned out, you know, a million and a half eggs, one of which grew to sexual maturity and spawned out another million and a half. You know, I mean, right. like, just because, you know, the, this program's been going on for 30 years, this sea bass thing maxes out 10, 10, 15 years, something like that, like, how many how many of those hatchery fish have gone on to produce millions of wild fish and right. that's that's a that's a number that just can never be quantified yeah so yeah that's that's part of what was acknowledged in the in the report um you know what what has been the contribution and the genetics that gets back at genetics questions and we're starting to kind of move forward and trying to address possibly some of those questions now but it all it all take, it takes funding and so again talking about getting tags and getting fishermen to turn in the heads i mean that's all Funding driven as well too. How much can we get out there? And so the, there's been challenges even there, and, and that was pointed out in the report too as a recommendation to, you know, this is one of the premier programs in the United States, and and we've got the longest data set to assess uh, replenished stock that we're that we're doing. But there's been years where 
the program, the, the assessment side has kind of stopped and there hasn't been any funding. And so, you know, the, 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 the scientists that are reviewed this program clearly pointed that out, that, you know, with all these recommendations and that being one of them, the funding, you know, it's unfortunate that we lost a, you know, four or five year period where we didn't have funds to, to look at the assessment side of it. So yeah. that data all comes back and it's all, it's all important. You know? Yeah, no doubt about it. And, 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 you know, after one of the things that's important is getting the public to understand what you're doing. And one of the things you did recently last month was the hosting the CCA banquet for the San Diego chapter of CCA. You guys have exposed so many new people to the program and exactly how complex and exactly all the hard work that you've put into that. It's really fantastic. Um, but how is your partnership with uh, CCA Coastal Conservation of California working and is that is that helping hubs? Oh, there's, there's no doubt. I mean, the, the recreational fishing community has been a huge uh, supporter. Um, you know, 90% of the funds that are generated, you know, they help. They have come from the recreational community. Yeah, we want so, to catch sea bass. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so CCA um, uh, is actively involved, and in, in they're actually one of their uh, primary goals is to help support this program. I mean, CCA in other states, you know, uh, that are doing stock replenishment like Texas and, and in South Carolina are huge supporters of those programs. Yes. And programs in those in those parts of the country are actually run by uh, their fish and wildlife, fish and game folks are, are fully invested in that. And so, you know, you know, they, they've CCA has been well established many of years down there, but uh, in those areas and, and they provide significant funds to help replenishment. So uh, um, CCA is, again, taking on that leadership role here in, in, in California now. I know they're fairly new, but while they build up their membership, they're helping to support us with the, the grow-out sites uh, that uh, are getting the fish that we're delivering. They're helping us with broodstock collections um, for the sea bass program and other fishery, uh, aquaculture fish programs that we've got, you know, for halibut and, and yellowtail or some other works that we're doing. So they're they're a huge supporters, and I look at that as as a huge advantage. I mean, we wouldn't be able to do the stuff that we're doing um, in this program without their support. And that's cool. It's yeah, it's unique worldwide the work that we're doing in this partnership. Oh yeah. Uh, compared to you know, you look outside these other countries, and sometimes we have international meetings. They go, "What are you guys doing? How are you doing? Huh? How are you getting what? your fish that large?" <laughs> and because most of the most of the re replenishment places are, are releasing, uh, you know. Fish that are, are really tiny. I mean, we're getting them to these eight to ten inches size, which is is pretty. pretty and how significant. how long does it take to get the eight to ten inches? Well, they, the first year they grow about an inch a month, so you know they're anywhere from eight to ten ten months old by the time they release. You know, we get those fish out the out the door. Wow. So yeah. with thirty yeah. years of experience, I'm sure you guys have every subset of, of data. Like, I mean, I, I'm just curious, very briefly, like what's the survival ship you think from a fish that gets released at a more common size around the country probably you know a couple of inches versus what you're releasing at eight to ten inches yeah yeah so when you look at the programs uh that are releasing red drum i mean they're they're their fish are only about a month a month and a half old so pretty pretty small and 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 they're they're more their survivorship is going to be similar to what you see in the wild, just a few percent. I mean, they acknowledge that and they know that but you know it's all a, a numbers game I mean, you know you can release millions of of you know sure. One inch inches, long yeah. or smaller than that, really. Um, and then, you know, we're releasing a couple hundred thousand or a hundred thousand fish that are eight to ten inches in size. But if you look at the biomass, I mean, that's certainly much different, obviously, in what we're releasing. So the survivorship would be higher, I mean, think in our fish. I think the what we've shown is that when we put fish in these grow-out pens, their survivorship, they learn the few months that they're in there, they have get acclimated to right. the environment, the taste, the smell, the sounds, predators. Um, and other f small bait fish that may swim into the net. They, um, these white sea bass are they're they're innate. You know, they're feeding behavior on other fish, so they're ready to go. And so, we've shown that fish that are released from those pens have the best survivorship compared to something that we may a fish that we may release directly from the hatchery. So, we've adaptively managed the program and now and tried to getting all fish into the pens uh, t before they're released, at least for a couple of weeks on the short term to a couple of months, because we know that gives them an advantage. So. We have grown, and, our, you know, our survivorship rate, again, you know, we'll go into some of these bays with our own sampling. And, and in New, for Newport Bay, for example, you know, some months and some sampling times we'll see, you know, 20% of what we're catching are, are, are white sea bass. Really what it gets down to is what's our contribution to the to the fishery, and that's when they get to be the 28-inch size, which takes them another three or four years to reach legal size. Um, so that's what, you know, getting heads back and, and, and sampling the fisheries at the commercial markets or, you know, again, getting the recreational guys and 
that that helps and that gives us more data. So, you know, we've had discussions about can we continue to adapt uh, our models. Those models actually were only built up until the time fish reached 28 inches in the fishery. We haven't had enough data coming back to be able to have confidence if we build these models what's 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 the, the whatever the number it spits out from the model what's our confidence in in that result and is it high or is it highly variable so we yeah. want to have high confidence and so to get that we need a lot more data to come come in and, and uh yeah it's still a, a work in progress yes, yes yeah every day yeah for sure what's the largest white sea bass that you have retrieved a tag from yeah. good good question because it Pop, just it popped just out happened. the egg and popped now yeah, egg. Yeah. yeah it just happened this year back in January oh, no and I don't know yeah so our largest a record fish came back from a kayak fisherman off of uh, Torrance who's fishing out there cut off a head turned it in he actually happens to work at the girl out pen that's up in up in uh, that Redondo Beach area cut the head off saved it. We got it back. It was a 20-year-old fish. Oh, wow. No way. 20. It's a big pond out there to be getting the sea bass back in 20 years. So that fish was about 50 pounds. Wow. At 20 years old. Um, and it was released from Dana Point uh, Grow Out Facility back in, what was that, 1998. Wow. So uh, 20 years, that's our record. I mean, we've, we also got another fish this year, too, that was 15 years old. We have a couple of years, a couple of, of fish that we've got that back so after cool. 15 years. How big was that 15-year-old? That 15-year-old, his weight was, uh, it was about 32 pounds. Wow. And uh, he came from a King, a, a, King, a King Harbor release that was actually caught by a commercial fisherman. So I'm um, seeing our fish move around and caught everywhere. And Yeah. You know. What was also interesting, too, is... Um, uh, the report that somebody caught a white sea bass in a in a school of bluefin uh, a few months. A yeah, months that was cool. How how that. is that possible, right? <laughs> well, you know, they're they're every, all the fish have tails and they use them and they're swimming yeah. around and hanging out together and and maybe they're waiting for some you know, bait to come down lower beneath the bluefin. That's uh-huh. that's pretty interesting. I mean, I've heard about sea bass being caught, you know, obviously with bait fish and the guys tart licking the birds and then going down under there and, and finding them that way, but. Finding one under yellowtail, that's or uh, bluefin. I mean, that's pretty that's interesting. That's pretty interesting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The few They're times eating. when they when they wind up, you know, there was a fish caught on this like offshore bank and the Cortez bank oh, and yeah, the Towner yeah. bank and thing, which is where that that bluefin was at. That yeah. those are the ones that always just you know make your head scratch. This fish that at least us as fishermen so closely associate with a kelp line and near shore and island and all those things, and then when you hear about that fish that was. A hundred miles offshore at the Cortez Bank, it's it's always that. What the what, you went what, out yeah. there? And I, and I was going to say how many are out there? Yeah, you know? I was going to say, did that happen out at the Cortez? Because yeah. we know uh, commercial fishermen go out there, they catch white sea bass out there. We have caught tagged fish, our tagged fish, out at the Cortez and Tanner Banks. Oh, okay. I mean, well, it's uh, kind of an uh, island, really. Yeah, yeah, and we never would have, right. you know, who would have thought, you know, our fish, hundred miles off the coastline, That's caught out so there. Cool. But we've got one from Newport Bay was caught out there, and one released from Santa Barbara. Were caught out the Cortez and Tanner Banks just a few years ago, yeah. but um, it's pretty pretty amazing to think you know that our you know these fish are running around. They run around everywhere. I know when we earlier part of this pro years when we started to sample the commercial markets, et cetera. You know the the guys would say, oh these aren't your fish. You know these are these rogue fish that are swimming around out there. Your fish are going to be up on the beach, meaning within three miles. And but yeah, you know subsequently we've proved them you know wrong and we're getting fish you know these sea bass are going everywhere they how travel. can you deny the effectiveness of that program of a fish that you let go in Newport yeah. that then joined wild population and then years and years and years later contributing to to regrow the population yeah. then caught 100 miles an offshore you yeah. just that's an undeniable thing yeah, yeah. for sure yeah. absolutely yeah. well as you can hear we have a great show lined up for you today a lot to talk about today obviously you're, right you're not kidding and mike i mean just such an expert for those that don't know not just on sea bass and things, but I mean, just all things are fishery. Just this is such a treat for us to all get to have, and a great show today, and lots of great information coming. If you've got questions, what a great day to do it. And there's two ways you can join us on Let's Talk Hookup this morning. First is with our local line. That's 858 area code 457. 1090. Again, 858-457-1090. That's our local number. Or you can reach us toll-free. That toll-free line is 877-792-1090. One more time, 877-792-1090. Now, for sure, the treat today is that Mike Shane's joining us, talking all kinds of great fishing, talking hubs. But, boy, a close second are the amazing prizes we have for you at the end of the show today. There are two fantastic prizes 
first of which is a brand new pair of Maui Gym sunglasses. And this is the Kanoa Coast that we're giving away. It's a great pair of My Maui Gym. My favorite gyms. frame. Yeah, these are really, really nice. This particular pair um, has that matte tortoise frame. The lens is the Bronze HCL, which I think has become my favorite. Bronze HCL is one of those things where if it's still a really bright offshore day, it still darkens things up to get very comfortable. But a lot of times it's overcast early and it's overcast late and they're not so dark that you can't wear them. It's a great, great lens color, that Bronze HCL. Of course, it's made with that super thin glass, which presides the absolute crispest optics available. It's 20 to 32% lighter than their standard than a standard sunglass. Standard I mean, that, sunglass. that's a huge... And, and you combine that with the Canoa Coast, which is a lightweight frame exactly. with the lightweight uh, uh, glass, that uh, super thin glass that Maori Jim makes. It's an unbelievable pair of glasses. The, the big thing, too, about, um, about that super thin glass that they have is, that, you know, the the reason we as fishermen want a glass lens is because of scratch resistance. You know, you they, there are very fancy polycarbonate lenses out there that provide excellent, you know, uh, shading of the light and you know do every yeah do, do everything that polarized glasses do. They cut the glare and all those things. What they don't offer is the the scratch resistance that glass does. And I'm sure if you talk to a, a glass person, you know, from a sunglass shop, they're going to want us all to clean your glasses with a microfiber. But we're fishermen. We don't do that. You know, you get yeah. spray from the cast of your reel. You lick your finger and you wipe it off with your T-shirt. And although you're not supposed to, glass is what prevents that from scratching. And these, even though they're 20 to 30 percent stronger, have uh, the the single best in scratch resistant and solvent resistance from your sun, you know, your suntan lotion. So it's just they're awesome glasses. There's yeah. nothing better. And somebody's getting a brand new pair of those Kanoa Coast glasses at the end of the show. If that wasn't enough, how about this for a prize for another lucky caller? Somebody's going to win an opportunity to take a group of four to go tour the entire hatchery with Mike, have lunch, you know, lunch at the facility, and you're going to get a private tour of the entire facility of the hatchery. Check out the the grow out pens and the whole the whole thing that they do at the Carlsbad Hatchery from Hubs. That's a priceless thing, that's priceless. you know. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm just Mike, thought, that's really cool that yeah. you're offering that up. No Welcome. doubt. Yeah, for sure. And you can definitely yeah. include me in your party of four. Oh, you know? one, one, <laughs> one lucky caller is going to win that. Yeah, so, so a couple of great prizes. Again, if you want to get your opportunity to win either of those great opportunities, or much better yet, just your chance to talk to Mike Shane, 858-457-1090 or 877-792-1090. When we come back, we're going to be taking your phone calls. Lots of great info coming your way. You stay tuned. You're listening to Southern California's Sport Fishing Voice. It's Let's Talk Hook Up on the Mighty 1090. Hey, everybody. This is Captain Dwayne. Wayne Diego, four-pack charter captain, here to talk to you about Parker Boats and the good folks at West Coast Marine. When it came time to start Pinnacle Sport Fishing and get my own boat, there was only one choice. I wanted a Parker, and there's a real good reason for it, the fishability and seaworthiness. I've been fishing on Parkers for years now, and I know the abuse they can take. Parker Marine builds a heavy-duty, industrial-strength boat, probably overbuilt, but that's what I need when we're out 12 hours a day, over 300 days a year, running charters. The guys at West Coast Marine built me one heck of a fishing boat, from the custom tower with steering and throttle controls to the backup bait pump system. My Parker 2520 XLD will deliver me to the fishing grounds reliably and safe. Take it from me. If you're ready for a new Parker at a fair, upfront, honest deal, you need to see Kevin Kelly at West Coast Marine, located at 1555 Newport Boulevard in Costa Mesa, or check them out and their inventory and information online at westcoastmarine.com. No matter what the season, Rapala Lure should always be a part of your fishing arsenal. It's time to stock up on the trolling lure that's proven to catch more fish. X-Wrap Magnum by Rapala. Every X-Wrap mag runs perfect right out of the box. All have extreme action with a controlled, deep diving, aggressive swimming motion. The large diving lip partners with premium VMC hooks and an irresistible rattle. Here's some big news. X-Wrap mags now get up to 40 feet deep with the new X-Mag 40. Spool up with suffix line, which was designed and recommended for trolling X-Wrap mags. And you have a deadly combo. You should also check out Rapala Husky Magnum Heavy Duty High Speed Trolling lures built for battling large game fish. The Husky Mag lures, like all Rapala lures, are built tough and available at a great price. So, bottom line, the x rap Magnum or the Rapala Husky Magnum are the ultimate trolling lures for Southern California and Baja saltwater fishing. Available in a variety of colors and sizes. No matter what you choose, the fish can't resist Rapala. Ask your local tackle dealer which is the hottest color and size and start catching more fish. See the entire lineup at Rapala.com. 
Turner's Outdoorsman, Southern California's number one shooting, hunting, and fishing tackle retailer since 1971, is right in your neighborhood. Now 19 stores and more to come throughout Southern California. No one does it better. Turner's Outdoorsman brings you the best prices and selection, plus a knowledgeable staff that will help make your day on the water or in the field more fun. Stop by your neighborhood Turner's Outdoorsman. To find the location nearest you, check the web at turners.com and sign up for special deals and more. Hey, it's time for the 30-second Power Pro Seminar. Here's the hot tip for those of us that like to fish with small reels for big fish. Fill your spools with Power Pro Max Quattro. It's 25% thinner than standard Power Pro. That means you're going to get more line on that small reel. Plus, you can fly line your bait more effectively. Here's another tip about Power Pro Max Quattro. Your casting distance will increase in addition to increasing your spool capacity. So downsize your tackle and use Power Pro Max Quattro. Check PowerPro.com for more information. XFRS 1090 AM Rosarito, Baja California. San Diego Sports Leader, the home of ESPN Radio, the Mighty 1090. Welcome back to Let's Talk Hook Up on the Mighty 1090. All right, phones are packing up. Uh, keep trying because all the lines are filled, but uh, a couple of great opportunities to win a pair of Maui Gym sunglasses as well as a personal tour for four, including lunch of the Carlsbad Hatchery and uh, lunch with Mike Shane. That's a really, really cool deal. Custom, uh, something you can't buy there. Yeah, so I just think it's awesome. going to be able to go to that. Very nice of Mike to do that. So let's go jump in the phones, Rick. You got it, man. Why don't we start it off this morning with Richard, who's called us from Monrovia. Good morning, Richard. Welcome to Let's Talk Hookup. Thanks for getting us started here. Good morning, gentlemen. I've got a, a few questions for you. Um, I, I was at all three of the public forums on the on the hatchery system this last year. And um, one of the things that came up a lot was how many fish congregate in the MPAs and how that affects the assessments on these fish, because we, we know that there's no noise there, and the fish hate noise. And so we've seen the free divers and the kayakers, and we, we paddle through to see them stacking there sometimes. And I see the same thing in Baja. And so do we get numbers from Baja? Mm-hmm. So the the just to back up here, the marine protected areas actually were not when they were their design. Was, white sea bass were not considered uh, species that they were going to protect under under that design. Uh, do they use those areas? Certainly. Um, we, when we know sea bass move around quite a bit, so you know they may be hanging out, you know, uh, there for a short period and then and then move on. You know, do they get protection? Do they grow in there? Most likely not. I mean, they, again, they, they move around so much. So while you will see, you know, juveniles and, and young of the year, we know that they're closer to shore. They, you know, when we do our own sampling, we're usually on the inside or, you know, shallow sides of those kelp forests. We do see a lot of juvenile sea bass uh, running around, around in there. So, you know, for short periods of time, they may get some, some protection in there. But, again, they're already protected in the, in the respect that they cannot be kept, or obviously, until they're 28 inches. Um, so, Yeah. Sea bass is yeah. such a u- unique fish in that, you know, when it's always available or it's always around in some capacity in, you know, in normal ground. You know, we're, we're in San Diego. You think Point Loma and La Jolla and Imperial Beach, they're year-round all the time is always a population of those fish. But there are times when it seems like it's not, you know, they're, they're elusive. They're a difficult fish to find and to catch and to see. And yet, yet in times of, you know, big bait influences, the squid years that we had, there's, you know, there's just millions and millions of them, it seems like, around. It's just such an odd fish that, you know, depending on where it's food at, there's massive schools around. And yet there's other populations of it that don't seem affected by that at all that are always in the kelp forest. And it's just, it's such a, it's such a unique and different fish from other things. Yes. Indeed, it is, yeah. as you're learning, right, Mike? Yes, yes. I mean, we know they obviously move around, and they're opportunistic. You know, if there's, you know, squid running around, they're going to eat squid. If there's large schools of bait, they're going to run around and eat, you know, and eat, and eat that. They're so, not well. just eating squid. They're eating anything they yeah. can, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So. All right. Hey, thanks a lot for the call, Richard. Appreciate you uh, supporting those meetings, too. Very good for you. Yes. Squid just gets them dumb enough that a guy like I can catch them. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, about it. Seven seven nine two ten ninety open right now. All right. How about next up? We talked to Armand, who's calling us from Long Beach this morning. Good morning. Welcome to Let's Talk Hookup. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. So I have a quick question for uh, Mike, or I guess two. Uh, where are the locations that you release uh, the white sea bass? And two, have you guys uh, put any tags besides the ones in the head, like an acoustic tag or maybe something like a satellite tag to see where they move uh, 
between when someone catches them. Yep. So that, those both good questions. So the, the release locations are up and down the, the coast. So we've historically released fish as far north of, of Santa Barbara. There was a girl outside up there. All the way down to San Diego Bay, uh, we've got a release site in there. Um, and then over at Catalina Island, there's uh, traditionally, historically, there's been uh, two. We've had our own system over there, and then another has been the, uh, funded by the Catalina Sea Bass Fund. Um, this past year, though, we've joined forces over at Catalina with the Catalina Sea Bass Fund, so there will be one one grow outside over there. And, and Is that the one pens. in Cat Harbor? Yeah, in Cat Harbor. Yeah. So we've got a large pen over there that has four Four systems, or four pens that uh, each pen is like 33 feet by 33 feet, and the net goes down 25 feet. And that's historically been a, a successful site. I mean, one of those pens, we can hold 30,000 fish in there. It's also wow, been a great so site cool. for us to collect brood fish. So that's how, how the program has collected our brood stock over the years, where we can fish over Catalina, hold them in these uh, a pen over there, and then have a commercial fisherman bring them back to shore to us and then eventually get in, into our, our, our tanks. With regards to uh, other tag types, yes, we have. A few years ago, we, we did some acoustic telemetry tracking. So we actually, in young young fish, uh, surgically implanted transmitters. So you can, you know, anesthetize a fish just like you go in for surgery. I perform these little surgeries and uh, surgically in, implant these transmitters. And then we'd let them go, you know, we'd probably do 20, 30 fish at a time, let them go with a large group of five to 10,000 fish, and then, track them around, track them by boat, which is pretty labor-intensive, or we can put hydrophones out in the water column or out along the coastline and listen for their and watch their movements. These hydrophones are basically data loggers. And so what we saw from those studies is that uh, the fish leave the bay pretty quickly in these in the bayments that we release them in uh, within about a week. If they, don't get, if they don't get out of the bay within a week, we end up uh, recovering their tags as a result of a predation event by a sea lion or a bird. Um, and when they leave the bays, what we found was interesting, in, in, in a couple of different bays, they leave the bays at night and on an outgoing tide. I mean, they had plenty of time to leave during the day on outgoing tides, but they always left at night on an outgoing tide. Right. In addition, we see that these fish move extremely fast. I mean, this is one of the things we talked about, the model, you know, how much of these fish disperse. And so... Um, we released a fish off Carlsbad. Within two days, it was up off San Clemente. I mean, wow. just a, a small eight-inch fish. I mean, these guys, I mean, they got tails, like I say, and they use them, and they, they yeah. boogie and, and move around. So yeah. um, It's a rough yeah. world out there. they got to keep moving. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, keep moving. Lots of things want to eat on them. Moving. Yes, yeah. that's right. No so. doubt about it. That's cool. That's just uh, some of the backstory of the incredible things that you do there that, well, that we don't hear every exactly. day. Exactly. I, I yeah. love this, man. This is yeah, awesome. Yeah, it's really cool. Hey, thanks a lot for the call this morning. All right, let's keep on rolling. This time we're going to talk to John. He's calling us from Mira Mesa this morning. Hi, John. Welcome to Let's Talk Hookup. Yeah, hey, good morning, guys. So I was um, at the little tour at the CCA banquet down on Mission Bay, and um, the guy giving the tour mentioned uh, all the the sources of protein to feed the fish uh, to make it more uh, cost efficient, and he mentioned uh, bird uh, bird feathers as part of an part of the ingredient. How did that come around? Can you talk yeah. about that a little? Um, yeah, I'm not uh, that from. I mean, I was given one of those tours, but that was probably wasn't. I know that wasn't me. That might have been Mark and. So we're looking basically uh, where that idea is coming from is the you know what's the protein source and what's what's in there. So we. Uh, for aquaculture, you know, feed these artificial diets, pellets to fish, and, and of course we need fish oil and fish meal are important components of those. But to be responsible and sustainable for aquaculture, we're trying to look at re- replacing some of the traditional sources, which would be, you know, small bait fish that we catch off of, of you know, sardines and anchovies off South America that are used for these uh, companies that are making these pellets for us in, in Canada and other places. So. We've been, you know, doing studies with soy, uh, replacing some of these uh, fish meal and fish with, with, with soy products. Um, bird feathers are certainly one of them because of the protein content. Uh, fish scraps that come from the processing plants, you know, what can be put in there. So aquaculture, you know, we, we do a lot of that research at, at both of our facilities here in San Diego. And so uh, the, the bird feather one, again, I'm not as familiar with, but, uh, you know, if, if it's going to be used, we're going to be testing it. We're going to be doing studies where we can... Uh, you know, examine, you know, what's the percent that you can replace of the fish meal. So we can, you know, make aquaculture ads. That's going to start growing, you know, in the United States and, and is growing worldwide. Make it more responsible and sustainable. And you think about the number of chickens and turkeys and 
feathered birds and the amount of feathers that probably are available. And if it's a protein source, yeah, protein is what protein a great, at some, what a on great some opportunity, level. right? Yeah. 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 It's a good deal. Hey, thanks a lot for the call this morning. Appreciate that. And glad you supported the CCA event there, too. That's a perfect uh, venue for having SOS in the CCA. There's no doubt about it. Scott Sherman from Snap Insurance. What's up, Scott? Hey, Scott. Hey, you guys doing? Well, I'm just loving all the information in the show today and just had a quick question for your guest. Um, I was down at the Hubs building uh, by SeaWorld the other day doing a little tour, and they had a couple of tanks in there where they were growing out a bunch of really very small halibut. And I was just wondering what the plans are and uh, with halibut, and if you guys are going to be kind of going down the same road with halibut as you did with the white sea bass. Yeah, good good question, uh, Scott. The the the, um, the halibut, you know, we've been doing halibut off and on for a number of years. Actually, when I started this program 30 years ago, halibut was a fish uh, that was under the ORHAP program, and uh, and we were culturing them. And and other there was another program that was involved up in LA, and so it's it's been there. I think over the years and the change of management within the department, it somehow got lost in the mix with regards to being. Uh, you know, listed as a, as a, an, a replenished species that ORHAP, you know, was was working on. So we've been working on it with uh, additional funding um, from the private recreational anglers, again, uh, culturing them. And the plans potentially are, yes, to maybe consider that as a species to release like the white sea bass. So the recommendations that came out, as I mentioned earlier, from the Science Advisory Committee, that was one of their three recommendations was to continue the program and add possibly other species. And halibut seems to be one of concern by the recreational fishermen. There are a lot of support and it seems to be one uh, that we'd probably start working on. But right now, so with, with the separate funding, we're working on working on that species right now to uh, hone our techniques again on aquaculture, get them to a release size, do some release experiments on them on what's the best size to release them at, time of year, et cetera. So if the program does make this change and switch over to, you know, adding another species or how it moves forward in the future and how it is selected, we're ready to go. That's Hit the ground running cool. with our own funds, uh, funding from, you know, the fishermen uh, prior to getting it, you know, say from the ORHAP funds that are generated from your fishing license revenues. Yeah. You guys don't just, you know, oh, we'll, we'll pick this and try it. I mean, there's years and years and years of data and work and everything that goes on. That goes yeah, I mean, we, we actually, a couple of years ago, if you remember, we, we started a survey of uh, to understand what the next species would be, and so we built models, too. I mean, again, we've learned from the white sea bass, you know, how would we do this again in the future? You know, if we had to pick white sea bass, would we really do it now because of all the challenges with its movements and, and things and assessing it, you know, to be able to ass assess the program. So we sent out surveys and all the Fred Hall shows throughout CCA, et cetera, asking the fishermen what they thought were were the uh, top species they'd like to see enhanced in addition to our modeling work that we did. Like, what do we know about this fish, how their movements, their culture work? So um, – Halibut rose to the top on both of those sort of works, and so you know halibut, you know maybe one that we'll do in the future. Here. Are they hardier than white sea bass? Uh, they seem to be a little harder with handling, uh, except they're they're a little bit slower growing than sea slower bass. Growing. So really, uh, yeah. even slower. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, interesting. Hey Scott, well, good stuff there, and hey, yeah, you're going to cool. be our guest in the studio next Saturday. Yeah, yeah, we'll be in next. Saturday, we can talk boat insurance, we can talk fishing, we can talk whatever you guys want to talk about. Hooping? Want all your <laughs> to me, yeah. You're going to give yeah. up all your secret spots in the bay, right? Get some numbers there, buddy. Uh, I don't know about secret spots, but I'll give techniques. How's that? <laughs> there you go. All right. All right. <laughs> I'll work with that. Cool, man. Hey, yeah. great. We'll look forward to having you in the studio next Saturday. You bet, guys. Great right. show. Thanks, Scott. Thanks. All right. That. Hey, when we come back, we got a lot more Let's Talk Hookup coming your way, more of your phone calls. we got Catcher Fours. we got all kinds of great stuff. You stay tuned. It's Let's Talk Hookup on the Mighty 1090. Here's John Ireland for Rancho Leonero. Ranch is small, you know. It's very personal, very intimate. I don't think there's anywhere else that you could have the old Baja feel and have all the miles of beachfront, the palapa roofs and the stone walls. There's not a room that you don't have some kind of ocean view. You don't give up any amenities at the ranch. It's just very rustic. You know how when you cook outdoors it tastes better? Well, that's Rancho Leonero. It just tastes better. We have paddle boards. We've got kayaks. We've got snorkeling equipment, of course. We've got 12 super pockets. We have dive ships. We've got over 40 kayaks at the hotel. We've got all accurate equipment, very top of the line. And um, when the fishing's good, we'll freeze your fish, pack it all up, send it home with you. People love it. They'll come back five, six times a year. That's the highest accolade we can get. 
646-2252-646-BAHA. And RanchoLandNarrow.com, it's unique. When it comes to fishing rods for saltwater, there's just one name you need to know, Calstar. Take, for example, the Graphiter series. It's a true graphite and fiberglass composite rod, the finest that's ever been built. And for anglers seeking traditional performance, durability, and quality at an affordable price, the Calstar West Coast series of rods and blanks are the ones for you. Their master craftsmen bring decades of rod building experience to every rod they make. So if you want your fishing rods to be truly state-of-the-art, I always recommend Calstar at fine tackle stores everywhere. Happy holidays from Fisherman's Landing Tackle. This is Doug Kern. Nothing could be better for that saltwater angler on your list than a gift from Fisherman's Landing Tackle and Shimano. We have the best Shimano has to offer, including Talica, Trinidad A, Therese, Stella, Tranks, Terramar, Colt Sniper, Torium, Tiagra, Flatfall, and much more from Shimano. Bottom line, we have the most complete selection of Shimano saltwater tackle and the knowledge to help you pick out the perfect gift. Check out our huge selection at Saltwater tackle.com or come by and see us at fisherman's landing tackle at fisherman's landing in san diego have you been looking for a live bait hook that keeps live bait alive look no further than japan's leading fish hook gamakatsu it's the little things that make the difference and gamakatsu hooks drive the point home with an absolute perfect bend and ideal barbs your bait swims harder and longer and when you get bit gamakatsu hooks bite back with a vengeance all hooks are not the same go with gamakatsu for infinite success gamakatsu Gamakatsu, simply the best. Check Gamakatsu.com. I can't wait to spend some quality time with my son fishing this year, teaching him about casting, how to choose bait, set the hook, and how to be safe on the water by always wearing a life jacket. Save the ones you love. A message from California State Parks Division of Boating and Waterways. Welcome back to Let's Talk Hook Up on the Mighty 1090. All right, let's find out what's biting out there. You got it, man. As promised, it's time for the Catch Report, which today is sponsored by Blue Guard Innovations, making smart bilge pump switches and sensors designed to protect you, your vessel, and the environment. If your boat lives in the water and you've not installed the BG-1 oil and fuel detector, you could be risking thousands of dollars in fines. The BG-1 will detect the oil in your bilge before you pump it into the water. It's just one of several switches and sensors made by Blue Guard Innovations. Check bluebgi.com or you can get their affordable products at Wilson Marine and at San Diego Marine Exchange. We're going to start off with our catch board up at Dana War Sport Fishing. Talk to the man, Captain Brian Woolley's on the line. What's up, Woolley? Hey, good morning, guys. How are you this morning? Good morning. Great. Great. Good, good. Hey, well, with that weather, we had a little bit of an abbreviated week, as I'm sure you can imagine. But, uh, you know, the half-day trips, we saw some good action early in the week with some good uh, bass action, again, kind of continued to roll through for us this week. Some uh, action on the surface, some good fly line action, as well as uh, some stuff on the sinkers there, some fishing uh, inside in some shallower water. Obviously, with that surf, you know, it limited the days that we were able to get in there and fish in, in that shallow water. But uh, some good fishing in there. Like uh, the last few weeks, the fish have been bringing the exotic baits, like the shrimp, clam, the mussel have had some real good success on the sheephead, seen some real nice fish. And then again, that calico bass and some chunk sand bass were caught on just about every trip, too. So some nice fish caught on the rubber lures, too. I throw that in there. Some guys uh, fishing the heavier heads, rolling those rubber lures across the bottom. Saw some nice bass. The three-quarter day runs here, we're still targeting that bottom fish. Some good whitefish action on the squid strips. Uh, live sardines fished really well, too, again this week for the reds and the grouper. And as usual, man, if you don't have a Colt Sniper jig or two in your tackle box when you're coming out three-quarter day fishing with us, uh, you're missing out on some fun fun fish and those things are just priceless uh, for these rockfish right now uh the halibut derby for us is rolling along phenomenally well the leaderboard is full believe it or not so now it's uh time for uh, knocking fish off the spot the still that top fish uh that 25 pounder still uh, locked in up there uh Cher owens is, who caught that fish went home with a nice prize pack for uh the big fish of the month of uh november so she had a nice almost thousand dollars worth of prizes and stuff so that she got for a uh, in the top for the whole month there. But uh, those boys are out today on the Clemente. Hopefully they get a few more fish on there, uh, move a few fish around. So uh, no spots are safe as of now on that uh, that derby leaderboard. So full schedule here. If you guys want to hop on a trip, give the landing a call. Number here is 949-496-5794. Of course, you can check us out on the web, too, at DanaWorth.com. And uh, this month, man, we got some good ways to save you some money getting out here. Obviously, I'd like to give you guys every week that discount code. The code for this month of December is going to be SAVE, like save money, S-A-V-E. That'll save you 25% on a half or three-quarter day. 
But the big savings here is the whole month of December, two kids, 14 and under, will fish free with a full fare paid adult on both a half or a three-quarter day trip. So that's a, a smoking way to get a kid out on the water, or two kids for that matter. Wow. That's a great, what a man. great deal. So so with a full paid adult, two kids get to go for free in December? Yep, on either half for a uh, three-quarter day. So what like, a say great for deal. Half day awesome. fare, 46 bucks, right, for an adult. A normal kids' fare is twenty nine bucks. You're getting almost sixty dollars in savings by uh, you know bringing the two kids Taking along. Taking a couple so, kids, yeah. Good for yep. you guys, Willie. So, That's so cool. And 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 save S A V E is the the code that saves you twenty five percent on uh, yep. when you book so online. So you don't want to come fish and you don't have kids or you know still use that code that'll save you twenty five percent on one of those half or three quarter inch. Great deal. Awesome. Thanks a lot. Very good, Captain Brian Woolley, and all the people at Dana War Sport Fishing, you guys are in the holiday spirit, obviously. <laughs> Keep uh, it up. That's right. We appreciate it. Thanks, guys. We'll see you later. See you, buddy. All right. all right. Now let's hit the surf. We're going to the beach with our surf fishing guru, Gundy Gunderson, on the line. What's up, Gundy? Hey, what's going on, gentlemen? Doing great, buddy. Good morning. Take your kid fishing. I love it. Yeah. Dana Wharf leads the pack in that, don't they? Yeah. You know, dragging the kids down to the beach and catching the surf perch is another way to get started, you know, and that's kind of what we're looking at. You know, it was a tough week of weather, obviously, big swell, wind, lots of dirty water, that, that kind of thing. Uh, things started to come together this weekend. They had a handful of perch, a few short halibut here and there. Uh, the catch of the week and maybe something to look forward to was uh, a 36-inch striped bass was taken down there near Oceanside, almost a 20-pound fish. Uh, I've talked about these guys before. They, uh, take up, take, they go down to the bait receiver and get, get, just enough live sardine. They got the system down, maybe 10, 12 pieces, and then they bucket it down, sometimes to the beach, sometimes to the lagoons. Uh, in this case, they were fishing low tide and fly lining the sardine outside the surf line there, and, and we all know how fishy that zone is between the beach and the inside of the kelp or the reef, and, and uh, you know, the, the uh, success they're finding takes a little work, but, boy, it seems well worth it. And then in the future, you know, striped bass, we've seen a lot this summer, and we should see plenty of fish this winter, especially with rain. You know, they like that fresh water being around. So you got to think about that. One of my favorite lures this time of year is the crocodile. You know, it's uh, it, <clears throat> the hard jerk baits work, but the crocodile has a lot more range. You get like a four-inch crocodile, and you can cover some water and find some of these fish, find these halibut. Uh, a couple other things to watch the perch bite. Has been improving small models to the south, but bigger models off the northern beaches. A two-pound fish took the last Uptown Derby. I think they're going to have another one on Saturday, so we'll get a good check on what's going on up there. But that Oxnard-Ventura area is really starting to come together. And then the halibut bite has been improving. Not, you know, uh, not spectacular, but the guys putting in their time prior to the storm were catching fish, you know, going down the coast, East Beach, Torrance. Uh, shoreline Drive, River Jetties, Cotton, uh, the Lagoon Mouse in North County, all that kind of stuff been kicking out fish. And the bite should bounce back as soon as the water cleans up. And jerk baits, and like I say, this time of year, I really like throwing spoons. You know, you cover a lot of water. And if you're a bait guy, you know, cut anchovy or something like that. But we're just looking, you know, this is a time of year, window fishing, so you get some clean water, you get a little time. It's worth it. And with those striped bass running around, that's uh that's a little feather in the cap. So. Heck yeah. I think that's so yeah, that's, yeah. that's a, wouldn't that be nice to develop a fishery like that, huh? Just cool. Yeah, I'm telling you, it's uh, it's been a good year for those things. It's cool knowing that that's always a possibility. You know, that's a, there's been enough of them around the last couple of years that you know, if you're fishing in the window with the right time like you were saying that, that that's a fish that you could add to your uh, add to your catch. That's a pretty cool one. And it's a crossover deal. You're usually angling for a halibut at the same time you may get one, you know, so that's something to keep in mind. I dig it. Well, great job, Gundy. We sure appreciate you putting up, putting together such a great report. And like you say, all it takes is a couple of days, a good weather window, and I know we got a couple of those coming. So appreciate a great report, and we'll look forward to talking to you next week. All right, gentlemen, have a good week. Thank you. All right, thanks, Gundy. Well, that's going to wrap up the catch port today. Again, don't forget the new 2019 Bill Varney CCA calendar is now available. It's got lots of new shots and great information for anglers, including those killer tide line tide informations if you're going to hit the surf. It's a must-have. You can get it at your local tackle shop, or you can get them online at surf fishtackle.com. Indeed, and CCA Los Angeles chapter is hosting a bluefin tuna seminar 10 a.m. next Saturday, December 8th at Alpine Village in Torrance.
They'll cover bluefin tuna techniques with three very special guest speakers, Ben Seacrest, Jacob Moreno, and Merritt McRae. There's no cost to attend. Everybody's welcome, and CCA will have free continental breakfast there for you, too. So for go- more details on this bluefin tuna seminar with some three experts there, check ccacalifornia.org. And check out this week's edition of Western Outdoor News, loaded with great information every week. Super cows on the front page, as well as bluefin tuna information, and, of course, uh, great uh, information on that Dana a Wharf Sport Fishing a Halibut Derby, too. So lots of good stuff this week's edition of Western Outdoor News. Hey, when we come back, we got a lot more Let's Talk Hookup coming your way, including big block of your phone calls. You stay tuned. It's Let's Talk Hookup on the Mighty 1090. Happy holidays from Fisherman's Landing Tackle. This is Doug Kern. Be sure to get that saltwater angler on your list what they really want. A gift from Fisherman's Landing Tackle and Pen. We have the best Pen has to offer, including International VISX, Fathom 2 Speed, Torque 2 Speed, Fathom Star Drag, and so much more. Bottom line, we have the most complete selection of Pen saltwater tackle and the knowledge to help you pick out the perfect gift. Check out our huge selection at saltwatertackle.com or come by and see us at Fisherman's Landing Tackle at Fisherman's Landing in San Diego. It's time to get excited about fishing, and Point Loma Sport Fishing has everything you'll need. They offer half-day and three-quarter day trips daily, perfect for families and the novice or seasoned fishermen. Point Loma Sport Fishing also offers overnight to multi-day trips, targeting the best of seasonal catches. Visit their website at pointlomasportfishing.com where you can purchase tickets online and get more information on the trips available. Or call 619-223-1627. When it comes to catching big bluefin tuna in local waters, Shimano has the gear proven to land the big ones. You already know the hot jig is the Shimano butterfly flat ball jig and when you match that with the right tackle system it makes this great jig even more effective we suggest you grab a tranks 500 hg and fill it with 80 pound power pro max quattro max quattro is 25 percent thinner which means 25 percent more line capacity when you hook that giant match your new setup with a Therese 70 h and you have the power to put the wood to that big blue fin tuna the tranks 500 hg has the cranking power you need and with the level wind you constantly Concentrate on fishing your Shimano flat ball and leave the line control to the Tranks reel. Hundreds of big fish have been caught on the flat ball. And when you add the Power Pro Max Quattro Tranks to Res Combo, you'll take your fishing to the next level. See your local dealer or check Shimano.com for all the details. XEPRS 1090 AM Rosarito, Baja California. San Diego's sports leader. The home of ESPN Radio. The mighty 1090. You've heard all about it. You know the anglers catching fish have it. So what's holding you back? It's a fact. Fishdope.com really does help you catch more fish and burn less fuel. Fishdope.com is the only fish finding service with a spotter plane along with a crew of top anglers on the water almost every day that report actual locations and catches. You can get daily catch reports from Point Conception to San Martin Island 365 days a year. Fishdope.com is for everyone, whether you have your own boat, fish on your friend's boat, or a sport boat. Fishdope.com has online planning tools, moon phase, tides, hot bite icons, and more. So bottom line is, if you don't have Fishdope.com, well, you're probably missing a lot of bites. Membership costs less than $50 of gas, and that's for the entire year. That's right, one year. What a bargain. Plus, use the special code to save $20 on a new Fishdope.com membership. Check it out today. Fishdope.com. Catch more fish, burn less fuel. Quality is the name of the game at Seaforth Sport Fishing in Mission Bay. Free parking and fully stocked tackle shop, plus a great fleet. It's no wonder Seaforth Sport Fishing is a favorite among anglers. Come aboard top boats like the Aztec, Cortez, Endeavor, Apollo, Outer Limits, El Gato Dos, Pride, Tribute, Tomahawk, Prowler, Pacific Voyager, and the Voyager. Plus, the new Seaforth, Sea Watch, and San Diego offer the finest half and full day trips available. Seaforth Sport Fishing for charters or regular open party schedule, check SeaforthLanding.com. Run by fishermen for fishermen in Mission Bay. We all need to get around, but we all need something different from our vehicles. Your San Diego County Ford dealers have you covered if you're looking for a new truck this month. Plus, it's SUV season, so they have great deals for everyone. Whether it's a new Echo Sport that is nimble and fun around town, or the Ford Explorer that is capable of putting a boat in the water and has seating for seven, Ford has you covered. 
Ford trucks and SUVs aren't just powerful and legendary. They have the latest technology that helps you seamlessly connect your smartphone and ensure you're safe on the road. Features like Pro Trailer Backup Assist on trucks are truly a game changer at the ramp, helping you back up a trailer by simply turning a knob on the dash and doing the hard work for you. So check out all the great deals during SUV season and save some money on the right gear for you. Learn more at buyfordnow.com or visit your San Diego County Ford dealers today. They'll be glad to hook you up.